So again, thank you for being here today in the morning. We're going to be talking about uh, large class tools. This is our first case review series that we are putting out there for our community uh, to follow and to just, again, just to bring up some clinical topics that we feel that they're going to be of, uh, of interest to our audience. Uh, the first thing I always want to share with you is just to be, uh, you know, just to say thank you to all our sponsors. Uh, uh, mainly Coltine and Olor Arts. They've been supporting our, our efforts for, for many years now uh, in, 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 a, in a continuous way. So, uh, you know, we just want to make sure that we give them a shout out and we uh, give them one more time a thank you for, for always being there for us. Another thing that I want to share with you is also our webpage. If you have any interest on our live uh, courses, uh, we're going to have one this year in September in, the, in, in Atlanta, 15 and 16. Um, I know that 16 is completely sold out. I think that 15, there's one more spot available for our porcelain veneer masterclass. So again, if you want any information on our live hand-on courses, uh, please make sure that you visit our webpage, www.romerodentalseminars.com. Another interesting uh, page that we want you to follow and subscribe is our YouTube channel. Uh, you can visit us there, Romero Dental, Romero Dental Seminars in, our, in, in YouTube, and just, again, subscribe. We have now more than 100 uh, videos. There are different formats, webinars, case presentations, just, and, and they're all free. So just for you to watch and sit down, and, uh, and you can earn some CE credits when you complete uh, our, our, our quizzes that are uploaded in our webpage. So again, if you if you want to watch any of these videos and if you if, if you haven't done yet, this would be a good opportunity to get started. So the first thing I'm going to talk today about when we talk about class twos is about the clinical management of the of, of what we call the deep margin. And I know that you this is going to be something that you're going to feel very familiar with because I know that we all uh, encounter this really difficult clinical situation when we have these large class twos. And, you know, many times the the gingival the the gingival floor of the of the proximal boxes of these large class twos are subgingival. And you know, the question that we all ask ourselves is, how are we going to manage this? And, and and the reason why we ask ourselves that question is simple. Um, let me go forward. It's simple because you know one of the things that we that we uh, that I'm sharing with you in this photo, as you can see in this in this uh, first molar, maxillary first molar, you can see how deep that mesial margin is. And there's a couple of things that I want to uh, be very clear here. You know what are the enemies of these deep margins? How why would they become very clinically uh, difficult to restore? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Reason number one: normally they are subgingival which means that when we are preparing or we are removing either caries or an old restoration in these areas, most likely we are going to damage the gingival tissue around these, these deep margins. And when we do that, when the bird touches them, when, you know, when using different instruments aggravates this area, you're going to get bleeding. Normally, if you have a patient with a active caries lesion at this level, they're going to show up to your clinical practice already with inflammation. And they're going to have inflammation just because they're getting food caught there. They're getting food impaction. They're not cleaning well because it's in, there's inflammation and it bothers them. They notice that this area bleeds when they try to clean the area. So all these factors will make this a very complex clinical situation from a doctor standpoint. We know, uh, you know, when our patients sit down in our chair and they tell us, you know, I have this discomfort on this, on this tooth, the tissue is bleeding, it's, it's kind of sensitive. We know that we're going to be confronted with a very inflamed gingival tissue around that deep margin. So there's only one way that you can control that. And believe me, that way is not using laser, is not using any, any, any means of cauterizing the tissue. It's not using a, 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 or packing cord. And for a couple of reasons, depending on how deep that margin is, you're going to have you're going to have a bone there. You're going to have interceptal bone in that area where it's going to make it very challenging for you to push that cord within that sulcus. Again, depending on how deep that margin is. Now, another clinical situation that you're going to have is that regardless of you being able to place a cord, that cord is going to have to have some type of hemostatic agent. And we all know that hemostatic agents will interfere with our bonding process. So if you pack a cord and you're going to be forced to use a hemostatic agent, 
because you want to control that bleeding, number one, you're going to have, I know you're going to have clinical difficulty getting that cord subgingively, but let's say that you are able to get it subgingively. Well, the other aspect that you're going to have is now you're going to have this, um, you're going to control bleeding, but you're going to have this cord embedded with that hemostatic agent that is going to be very in intimate contact with that deep margin. Now you're going to have difficulty keeping that margin clean so that you are able to bond, you know, whatever type of restorative material you're trying to use. So those are two really critical clinical situations that we are confronted with every day. And I know that this happens to you because it happens to me every single day in my practice. So what is the number one way that you can control this? Well, whether you want to hear this or not, the only way you're going to be able to control this in a controlled, uh, you're going to be able to control this in a, in a, in a good way is using rubber dam isolation. Now, when we're talking about rubber dam isolation, you are seeing on this photo, I have a W3 clamp sitting directly onto that first molar. So that first molar is going to be where my retentive clamp is going to be. At the same time, I have to create room, enough room for me to place a band so that I can go ahead and elevate that margin. But the most important thing that you need to understand is that because that margin is deep, you're going to have to push that rubber dam slightly subgingival. You need to get a good, the, the septum of that rubber dam to go subgingival so that you can get complete control of the curricular fluid and any bleeding in the area while you are performing any clinical procedures here. And in order for you to do that, you have to understand one key element. You got to make sure that your perforations, the distance between the perforation for the first molar and the perforation for that second premolar have at least five to seven millimeters in distance. You will not get away in, the, in a case like this if you have less than five millimeters between your perforations. And you got to think about this. The more separation you have, five to seven millimeters between these two perforations, in this particular case, I've created four or five perforations, but these two are the critical ones. These are the ones that you have to create enough separation so that when you're pushing that rubber down more apically with your clamp, you do not get any tissue exposed. If your perforations are too close together, you're going to get tissue exposed. And if you get tissue exposed, you're going to get bleeding or curricular fluid uh, invading this clinical, this critical clinical area. So that's tip number one. But tip number two is that you're going to have to push this clamp uh, way down to the gingival margin. So you got to make sure that it's seated all the way down in the cervical aspect of this molar. In this particular case, I was able to get away with a W3, but another clamp that I also like is a W8A. And the reason why I like the W8A is because the W88 has both of its beaks are pointed more apical uh, uh, so that it means that they're going to be further away or more uh, uh, apically located in, re in, in relationship to the cervical portion of the tooth. And that's going to give you an added two to three millimeters for you to be able to sit this, uh, you know, either a miler or, or, uh, or any type of circumferential band system that you're going to need in order for you to elevate that margin. Now, what you're seeing here is a regular Toffelmeyer band that I have sectioned in half so that I'm able to displace it all the way down and get access to that deep margin. Now, another critical aspect that I want you to see that you're going to be able to see through this photo is that the reason why it is so important for you not to not only to keep, to keep that margin clean, like you're seeing on this photo, no bleeding, no curricular fluid, really good isolation and control of the operative field. But the most important aspect is for you to understand that there is no enamel on that margin. So that margin in my mind is not a good margin for me to bond any type of resin to. I'm going to use a resin modified glass ionomer or a regular glass ionomer in order for me to elevate that margin. Personally, I like the resin modified glass ionomer for this clinical situations. I like it because it has a primer. I like it because I can, I can inject it in the cavity in one thick layer. I like it because I can control the time of setting of this material by using my curing unit. So there's a lot of features that I like about this, this specific material for these particular cases. So I use resin modified glass ionomer to elevate this margin. And again, the reason why I use it is because I am able, I don't need to edge, I don't need to use any primary bonding. All I need to use is a, I'm going to use a, um, 
a, a primer that is gonna prepare this surface for me for 10 seconds, rinse and dry, and then directly inject the resin modified glass ionomer to, to be in intimate contact with that dentin and elevate that margin. Now, when I'm talking about margin elevation, and this is what you're seeing right there, you can see now that my resin modified glass ionomer has been injected into that margin. I'm gonna condense that resin modified glass ionomer using a, 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 co a cotton pellet with a little bit of water. And that's another thing that I like about the resin modified glass ionomer, that even though you don't want excess, excess moisture in that area, you can have a little bit of water on a cotton pellet to condense it nicely and to get it nice and smooth as seen on this photo. Now, once, I'm, once I am able to, uh, to light cure this margin, I can go ahead and I can use a diamond burr or any type of burrs and I can smooth it out, I can bring it down because obviously you want to have that, mar that elevated margin below the contact area of the proximal tooth. And the reason is because you want to reestablish contact in between these two teeth by means of a resin composite, of a nano hybrid or nano filled resin composite. So I went back, I cut back a little bit of the, of the material. I make sure that this resin modified glass ionomer is below the contact area. And then I'm going to use a second uh, uh, um, uh, or a second circumferential system. In this particular case, I'm using the auto matrix system, which is a system that I personally like a lot because it doesn't have the bulkiness of having a retainer holder. I don't need to use any rings. It's just the band that you insert it in between teeth. You use a special tool to just tighten that band around the tooth. All you have to make sure that you do is that you have to create a lot of pressure with the wedge. You can see my wedge been inserted already here between the second premolar and the first molar, and I'm gonna create a lot of pressure. You gotta make sure that you create enough pressure to compensate for the thickness of your band. So you gotta make sure that you use an, a large enough wedge that goes through and through, and that will create that separation, that mechanical separation between these two teeth so that I can compensate for the thickness of the band and you know establish a, an ideal contact once I'm done with this, with this restoration. So at this point, I am ready to now acid edge prime and bond the remainder of the tooth structure because I've already elevated the margin. I've already increased, uh, I've already taken that, that deep margin on the proximal box more coronal. And I know that I have a really good clean transition between that glass ionomer and the dentin. And I have, you know, a, a chemical bond between these two materials because of the way that glass ionomer interacts with dentin. So this is, again, the ideal situation. This is what I like to do. This is the way that I like to manage these clinical situations. And after that, again, it's just layering your composite the way that you would normally do with any composite system. In this particular case, I'm using Brilliant Everglow from Coltine. And this is the number one composite resin system that I use in my office. And again, I'm gonna reestablish that proximal contact first. And then I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna try to build some anatomy using you know, uh, uh, oblique layers within that occlusal surface of my preparation once I've completed that uh, proximal wall. So as you can see, this is immediately after placement of the composite. And then after that, I just go ahead and remove any excess, you know, uh, adjust the occlusion and just polish to high gloss uh, this composite resin. What do I have here? I have a restoration that has a, that had a deep margin that was elevated with the resin modified glass ionomer and a contact that was reestablished using a, a, a just regular nano hybrid composite resin. And again, you saw the technique. The most important thing was critical rubber dam isolation which is very, very important. We have two webinars for free on our YouTube channel that are dedicated exclusively to the basic rubber dam isolation and to advanced rubber dam isolation that I would highly recommend you watch and share with others, please, uh, just so that you get a good idea and sense on how we go about uh, you know, more complex uh, isolations. The second aspect that I wanna share with you in regards to this case review is what we call the back-to-back -back class two. I get questions about this all the time. This is a, you know, it, it is a very complex clinical situation that if we manage it at the same time as, I, as I'm gonna share with you here, it, it just makes it more efficient from a clinical standpoint. It would take you a lot longer for you to do individual restorations one-on-one -on -one, and sometimes you just can't do it because you have such bad uh, interproximal contacts or interproximal contours of previously existing restorations that in order for you to, you know, just to make one function with the other, you're gonna to have to remove both at the same time. 
And that's exactly what happened to me in this particular case. As you can see on the photo on the left-hand side, I had two, uh, 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 I had uh, one DO and one occlusal composite that had, for some reason, they had kept the marginal ridge, as you can see here, but on that inner proximal area, there was a small cavitation underneath that marginal ridge that they decided not to remove. But when they restore these teeth, both of these teeth were almost attached together. This patient cannot get a floss in between these two uh, restorations because they were just literally bonded together. So the first thing that I did is I, again, rubber dam isolation. I used a very large wedge to create some type of separation in between these teeth so that I can go ahead and remove um, both of these existing uh, composite restorations. Now, what you're seeing on the left-hand side is that when I was trying to wedge to create some type of separation, my rubber dam tore. So I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to use this rubber dam initially, but then I'm going to change. I'm going to switch to a new rubber dam, as you can see on the right-hand side, once I have removed and I've been able to control um, uh, you know, the actual preparations. Now, if you look in the photo on the left-hand side and you see the amount of force and the size of that wedge that I've been using, I think it's obvious for you to understand that once I remove that wedge, bleeding is going to be part of this uh, 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 of this clinical case. There is no way that tissue is not going to bleed. The tissue was inflammated already. The patient was complaining about sensitivity in the area because she couldn't floss. So just imagine the amount of food and debris that was packed in that area. Imagine the amount of inflammation that she already had when she sat in my chair. And now I'm going to add the trauma of the wedge. So for sure, this is going to be a lot of bleeding once I remove that wedge. And if you have bleeding, and I know you have it every single day in your practice, my question to you is, how do you plan to restore these teeth without good isolation? Believe me, the cord is not the answer. Uh, laser is not the answer. You want to have good control of this operative field. And the best way that this can be accomplished is by means of a rubber dam isolation. So what we did in this particular case, we placed a W3 on the first molar. We were able to create five to seven millimeters between the perforations between these two premolars, and now I have these two, what we call back-to-back -back class twos. You can see that both interproximal surfaces are looking one to each other. So now that I've removed these fillings and I've completed my preparations, I wanna talk about how am I gonna restore this contact when I have back-to-back -back restorations. And again, today we have so many good options in regards to sectional matrix systems that this is this is definitely the way to go. Now, what you're seeing here and the things that you have to keep in mind in order for you to be able to accomplish this is a couple of things. Number one, you have to have a good sectional matrix system. Now, there's a lot of good systems out there. This this system that I'm using, this is an old case of mine. This system that, I, that I'm using here is the old version of the Garrison ring, which I still love. I think that this is something you must have in your practice. I do believe that there's a lot of different systems today that have you know, wider beaks that are very, very useful from a clinical standpoint. But I have encountered multiple clinical situations where none of those systems actually work. And mainly when my mesial distal width of my, uh, of my I'm sorry, my lingual buccal width of my proximal boxes are, are, um, are too wide. When they are too wide, it is very hard for me to actually stabilize any of these rings. So I still like using the old version of the Garrison ring, which I have in my practice, still have it there. I don't use it as much as I used to because now I'm using a lot more the 3D by Garrison. Now the 3D matrix system by Garrison, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about this in a future case review so that I can go through this system because it really has made a huge impact in the way that I do class two restorations today because the design of this 3D is almost perfect. But I say almost perfect because it's almost good for I would say 95% of cases, but I still have at least 5% of cases where I need to go back to this old version just because it, as you are seeing in the photo, these are two rings because the bite times on each ring have different length, different heights. So there's one that is short, one that is high, so that you can literally in, superimpose one ring. You can put two rings, as you are seeing on this photo, for clinical situations like the one that I'm sharing with you here. And what I want you to know is that because these two rings have different heights, and I will share with you a diagram that was done by a friend of mine just to kind of exemplify what this means, you're going to be able to put one right on top of the other. And not only that, 
but as you can see they are they are uh, they are placed within the in, you know inside or, or towards the mesial or the distal of the actual wedge so the wedge is not only stabilized by the ring but also the ring sits on the wedge and on the two surface so that is completely stabilized as you can see you create a really good anatomy of the bands you have a really good lingual embrasure created by the pressure given by these two rings you have a very nice buckle embrasure created by the pressure of these two rings and you have a beautiful flow of your sectional matrices you know that uh, that are actually following the contours of the tooth and this is something that sometimes with you know the v the v-shaped uh, type of rings like the ultra dense system and other systems out there you're just not able to accomplish it's much harder you have to add resin you have to add a whole bunch you have to add teflon there's so many tips and tricks for you to make them to you know, make them adapt better that you don't need with this regular and an old version of the bite of what is called the Bytine Garrison original Garrison ring. So again, this is the reason why I still recommend using this ring because as you can see, I was able to accomplish ideal anatomy of both of the bands, and not only that, I was also able to use a large enough wedge to create orthodontic separation of these two teeth to compensate for the thickness of these two bands. This is critical for you to understand. You're gonna get some separation of these teeth because of the pressure created by the bitine rings, but also you need to create some additional separation of these teeth by means of a wedge so that you can compensate for now not one band, but the thickness of two bands. So once you do that, again, I wanna show you on the right hand side, the clean junction between my band and the actual enamel of the proximal box that is critical because you don't want any spaces left behind so that you don't have any flash uh, or, or over contours on your on your uh, gingival margins. But again, this is a, a diagram of exactly the same case that was done by my dear friend, Dr. Gary Chaik. And you can see how he was able to design. And this is exactly how this uh, garrison ring works. You can see how you can put one garrison ring on top of the other because one of the bite times is taller than the other one. So you're able to in superimpose one on top of the other, create enough pressure for you to compensate for the thickness of both of these bands. And that's really what you want to try to accomplish when you're using these systems. Again, once you do that, the first thing that I always recommend doing is going back and restoring these proximal walls first. Make sure that you have your both of your proximal walls so that you know, okay, once I have you know, taken these, these preparations from a class one to a class two, from there on, it's just a basic class one that you're gonna restore. That's what you're seeing here on the left, on the right-hand side. I already have my mesial wall, the distal wall of that first premolar uh, restored. And then I'm going to go ahead and do the same thing for the second premolar. Then I go into the occlusal anatomy and I literally finish my preparation. And that's what you're seeing there. Once you remove the rings and you remove the wedge, you can see that I've been able to accomplish a really nice proximal contact with nice buccal and lingual embrasures. I want you to pay special attention to the gingival tissue between the lingual embrasures, how inflammated that tissue is. So keep in mind, if you don't have good rubber dam isolation, it's going to be really, really difficult for you to, you know, to restore these cases because you're not going to be able to control that bleeding or curricular fluid from contaminating that critical aspect of your preparation, which is that gingival margin. And finally, I'm going to talk about caries removal strategy. And the only reason why I'm talking about this is because just recently in, a, in, a, in the last couple of days, the American Dental Association came out with a practice guideline. And I am so thankful for the American Dental Association and for all these researchers that are named under this article for doing this for us. And the reason why I'm so thankful is because this is nothing new. This has been, there's a lot of evidence to support these concepts and they have been out there for at least 10 to 12 years. So we know that partial caries removal is a good option and a, an excellent clinical option for many complicated, you know, cases that where we have extensive decay on, in, on, on, you know, on some of the teeth that we're trying to restore. But the reason why I'm so thankful is because every time that I was lecturing and I would talk about 
partial carriage removal, at least I had, you know, 5% of the audience look at me like I was a weird bug. And the reason why they were looking at me like that is because in, during their time in dental school, they were taught that you need to remove every single speck of caries before you go ahead and restore. And you know what? You know, I was taught that way also. I mean, I graduated, you know, uh, 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 30 years ago. So, I mean, I know and I completely understand and get where these people are coming from. But we have to keep up to date with what the evidence is stating. And we have to understand that today the most important thing is that we have clean margins, at least two millimeters from the enamel all the way in towards the pulp, uh, towards the, the axial wall in our boxes. If we have clean peripheral, two millimeters of clean and peri per clean peripheral, peripheral enamel and dentin, two millimeters within that preparation, buckle and lingually on our, on, I'm sorry, on our buckle, or on our mesial or distal boxes, we are going to, we know that we're going to have good sealing of our restoration. And that's what this game is all about. The game is about creating a seal where you prevent that this bacteria that's now, you know, uh, carries dentin within your preparation, prevent from getting nutrients for this bacteria. That's the name of the game. And finally, we have it coming as a practice guideline from the American Dental Association. And I'm just going to share with you this information because I think it's so valuable for us, the clinicians, the ones that do this all day long in our practice. And the first thing that I want you to do is I want, I want to share with you what they, what they, you know, the definitions on caries tissue removal approaches that they, that they are using in this article. And I just want to share with you just a couple of things, like what they call the non-selective carries removal, which the name says it all. Non-selective, just remove anything and go all the way to heart tissue. Now, when you think about this, how many cases do you have in your practice that are extensive carries that if you use this, this, this concept of non-selective carry removal, you're going to get into the pulp and you will end up devitalizing that tooth or you would end up in such deep dentin so close to the pulp that now you have to change your, uh, your etching and primer strategy. Because if you do total etching, most likely you're gonna get some of those monomers infiltrating within the pulp and creating pulp on necrosis. So you gotta think about this because we know these are common clinical issues that we have with our, with our adhesives. So you also have what they call selective caries removal. And the name says it all, selective. You select what you remove and what you maintain. So the selective caries removal, according to their definition, caries tissue is removed until soft or firm dentin is reached, also known as partial or incomplete caries removal. And that is you know, one of the, one of the, the key elements to understand in, in these definitions. And finally, I would say the stepwise caries removal. And again, this is just a concept where you come in, you remove some of the decay, you get into soft dentin, and then you restore that tooth temporarily. You wait a couple of months, and then you go back and you remove that temporary filling, you remove more of the caries, and you restore that tooth to a definitive restoration. From a clinical, this is very, very uh, useful from a theoretical standpoint, but it's not that useful from a cl real clinical standpoint. So it's there. I think it's important for us to know what that means. But again, that's not something that I would do in my practice. I just don't see uh, the clinical applicability on real day-to-day -day dentistry. And then obviously you have the no caries tissue removal, where is that you just go ahead and, you know, use some type of interim restoration glass ionomer and just go ahead and put it on top of, uh, of a of a of a um, of a of a, a tooth that has extensive caries without any caries removal. Again, these are clinical situations that I would not see myself doing, but it's important to know what is it that they're looking at from a research standpoint. The other thing that I want you to know is that in the way the way that they were looking at this at all these studies, they were actually using what we call the ICDAS classification system or the International Caries Detection and Assessment System. From a professional standpoint, from a, a clinical standpoint, you know, dentists don't really use this system in a private practice setting. This is a system that is used a lot in clinical dentistry education and operative dentistry education. At the undergraduate level, we do teach this to our students in, in different dental schools in the United States. But the reason why I put it here is because I want you to understand that the kind of caries that they were looking at is what they call the medium and the extensive caries. Medium caries is what we would call a code three or a code four in the ICDAS system. Extensive caries is what we would call a code five or a code six. So let's just read what this means. Code three means localized enamel breakdown and code four means underlying dentin shadow. So how do you diagnose this? 
I'll show you a couple of cases. When you see almost an intact enamel, but there's a huge shadow underneath, you know that there's an, a, a, a code four. Or when you see widening of that occlusal anatomy, widening of the pin fissure system with stain and with brown and white staining, now you know that you're in a localized enamel breakdown. That is what we would call like, an, like a medium uh, 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 caries lesion. And then the extensive caries lesion is a code five or six where you can see a distinct cavity Visible with visible dentis or breakdown of the enamel, there's a there's a definite cavity there already. Now that's a code five. And then the code six is what an extensive cavity with visible dentin is. So you can see that it only has to do with size. The larger the cavitation that you are able to see, the more dentin that you see, the higher the, the IC dash classification. And this again is just for you to know exactly what is it that they were looking at and what is it that you're going to be reading here when you're talking about moderate or advanced caries lesions. And again, from a caries tissue removal approach in permanent teeth, this classification also includes temporary teeth. I don't, I don't work on children, so I'm not going to talk about that, but I am going to go into what permanent teeth are and you know how they, what they were looking at in regards to, to, to tissue removal. And again, when we're looking at permanent you know, uh, teeth with moderate caries lesions, they were looking to treat moderate caries lesions on vital permanent teeth requiring restoration the guideline panel suggests prioritizing the use of selective caries tissue removal over non-selective caries tissue removal. So they are even recommending this for moderate caries lesions. You don't have, because think about this, it all depends on the age of the patient. Younger patients have more permeable dentin. So that means that the, 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 the diameter of their uh, dentinal tubules are wider, even on medium to shallow uh, type of restorations. So you have to think about this so that you can identify the strategy that you're going to use to restore this tooth. So the more you preserve dentin, the more and they're saying remove the soft dentin, get into, get into that first layer of hard dentin that is still affected dentin, but it's not uh, infected dentin anymore. That is crucial. This is what we call already selective caries removal. Now, in advanced caries lesions, they're also recommending the guideline panel suggests prioritizing the use of selective carriage removal over stepwise carriage removal. So they're not recommending you go ahead and say, okay, you know what? Let me just go ahead and put an interim, let me remove some of the cavity or the caries. Let me put an interim restorative material and I'll have this patient come back to my practice in a couple of months and then go and see what happens from there. They're not recommending that. They're recommending, no, you go ahead and do selective carriage removal get to the hardest, you know, to, to get to remove the soft dentin, get to that first layer of hard dentin, and then go ahead and restore from there. And that will be your definitive restoration. If we are able to seal that restoration with any of the materials that they recommend, we're going to be okay. We're going to maintain the vitality of the tooth most likely, and we're going to allow this tooth to, you know, to, to be healthy uh, from there on. The other thing that they're also recommending is the actual restorative materials. I don't want to get into all the details of this, but I did want to share with you just a couple of thoughts. There are classifying, obviously you see the class one and anterior and posterior te teeth, but this, this is the class one and anterior permanent teeth, class three on anterior permanent teeth, and class five on anterior permanent teeth. So for class one, pin fissure lesions on, let's say the cingulum of a eight or nine, they're recommending conventional glass ionomer cement, hybrid resin composite, or resin modified glass ionomers. These are the three restorative materials that they are recommending. In my mind and in my hands, it's always gonna be, number one option is gonna be a hybrid resin composite under good isolation with a good uh, um, adhesive protocol. But that doesn't mean that you can't use, you know, conventional glass ionomer or resin modified glass ionomer. Again, they looked at Standard, uh, uh, um, they looked at randomized clinical trials and they looked at a lot of research in order to get to these conclusions. And this study is out there. You can go ahead and look for it in Google and just download it and read it for yourself. For class threes on anterior teeth, they're recommending their first uh, suggestion is a nanocomposite or a hybrid resin composite. Obviously that makes all the sense in the world. It's in a more aesthetic area and we want to make sure that we, you know, that we get the best aesthetic result. And then for class fives, their first recommendation is either conventional uh, glass ionomers, resin composite, 
or resin modifying glass ionomers. And again, this has a lot to do in my mind, at least with the isolation method that you prefer. I honestly think that resin modified glass ionomer is a great option for more geriatric patients that have high caries risk. Maybe even using just a regular Fuji 9, a regular glass ionomer, even better for these patients. But you are going to have to determine whether these patients are high caries risk or just non cervical caries lesions. Those are going to determine exactly the type of material that you're going to use for your clinical case. And for posterior teeth, class 1, class 2, and class 5s, again, they're making the recommendations. For class 1s, I would not recommend a conventional glass ioner, uh, you know, but they are talking about dental amalgams, resin composite, and resin modified glass ionomers. Again, you have to th think about the age uh, uh, of the patient. If there are more pediatric patients, you may want to consider a glass ionomer, but you're going to have, you know, these are permanent teeth, so you're going to have to eventually, you know, redo that restoration because the wear pattern of these materials is much uh, lower than the resistance, the wear resistance of any resin composite. So for me, the resin composite is the way to go for these teeth. I don't do any amalgams, nothing against the amalgam, but that is also a good option. For class 2 posterior, permanent posterior teeth, again, they're recommending amalgam, resin composite, resin modified glass ionomers, and all this over conventional glass ionomers. Again, I would stick to the composite resin. I think that if we manage these cases well, if we think about you know, deep margin elevation and glass ionomers, all the things that we just mentioned, that's going to make it a lot easier for us. And it's just, you know, the clinical thought process that we have to go through when we have these cases. For moderate or advanced caries lesions on vital permanent posterior teeth, class 5 specifically, they are recommending conventional glass ionomer, resin hybrid composite, and resin modified glass ionomers. As I said before, this has a lot to do with the reason why you are restoring this case. Is it a high caries risk patient? Is it a non-cervical caries lesion? What is it that you're confronted with? That's when you decide and you choose the type of material that best suits your needs. For root caries lesions on anterior, posterior, or posterior permanent teeth, they are recommending resin modified glass ionomer or conventional glass ionomer as the material of choice. And these normally are you know, older patients with re recession or, or, or sequelae of periodontal disease that are getting these root caries. So that makes all the sense in the world. This is a chart that just came in, to, in, in the actual uh, um, uh, um, uh, practice guideline that you can, that it makes it, you summarize everything that we just mentioned. But again, I think that, you know, I'm, I'm thankful for this chart because it really helps us have a more professional and more, uh, um, you know, evidence-based conversation when we're talking about this specific option. And just to share with you a couple of ideas here, you can see this is one of my young patients. Uh, again, uh, this is an IC-4. You can see that, well, maybe three and four because you can see a little bit of the whining of one of the pin fissure systems with a very dark, but you also see that shadow underneath that quote unquote intact enamel. So this is more a combination of an IC-3 and four. On the right hand side, I was able to remove some of the caries. Now think about what I said at the beginning. This is a very young patient. This young lady was 17, 18 years old. The tooth was hypersensitive. That's why the mom brought her to me. And again, if you have hypersensitivity, you know that you have high permeability between this dentin and the pulp. You don't want to go ahead and do total edge technique. You don't want to do full, you know, non-selective caries removal. These are the cases where you want to do selective or partial caries removal. You can see that I was able to get into the the hardest dentin possible, but there is some in affected dentin still there. And that affected dentin, you can do two things. In this particular case, because of the hypersensitivity, I chose to use ultra blend to seal that those dentinal tubules. There's other strategies that you can use for this. This is the one that I decided to use with her, but you can also decide to use a selective etching technique, which I'm going to share with you later. And then you can use, uh, uh, um, uh, I, would, I, I like using a two bottle uh, self etching uh, bonding system like OptiBond Extra Universal from Kerr. So this is the system that I like using. And again, why? Because you want to, you don't want to etch this deep, this, this deeper dentin when your patient is, was in your chair because of hypersensitivity, because you can create even more sensitivity. So what you're trying to do is to protect or to seal that dentin with the least, uh, with, with the, with the mildest acid possible, or you seal that dentin with a liner like ultra blend. That is what I decided to do for this particular case.
And again, this is another case, different case. Also a young lady, 18 years old at the time of this restoration. You can see this is an IC-4. IC the enamel is, you know, you can see that shadow underlying the enamel. I went ahead and opened that enamel. You get to dentin. The tooth was hypersensitive. You can see also on the premolar exactly the same thing. IC-, I would say there are three getting in, but look how deep that restoration was, that preparation was, I'm sorry, a lot of cavity. We, we get into that initial layer of hard dentin. We know it's still a, a affected dentin, but we are able to treat that dentin. In this particular case, I chose to use a selective etching technique where I'm gonna just selectively etch the enamel. I'm gonna clean all that surface initially with pumice just to make sure that I get rid of any, uh, any um, um, you know, like lipoproteins there that are just in the saliva uh, and just clean that nicely. But you can see now that I'm only selectively etching that enamel. I am not etching the dentin. This is deep dentin. This is still some, some, some uh, affected dentin there. I'm going to go ahead and use a two bottle system with a self etching primer and, uh, and an adhesive, which is the one that I use is uh, again, Optibon Extra Universal. I do drop number one for 20 seconds, drop number two, place the adhesive and then go ahead and like here. Now I have selective etching technique, only etching the enamel for 15 seconds, and then self etching the dentin, this deep dentin, so that again, I don't go and, 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 and you know, create any permeability of my adhesive through the dentin and into the pulp and possibility creating more sensitivity for this patient. Another case, this is now an older patient, around 50 years old. Again, you can see the extensive carries uh, and extensive wear of many of the restorative materials. Number one thing I need to do is I need to accomplish good isolation. You can see that these are multiple restorations that I'm going to be doing for this patient, but I want you to pay special attention to the distal margin of that first molar. Look how deep that margin is. Very, very deep, but I was still able to get that rubber dam all the way down that distal margin because I'm using a floss ligature, and that floss ligature is going to push that, uh, that, that rubber dam more apically. And again, that's, that's one thing that I teach on my rubber dam uh, isolation webinars, part one and part two, would I highly recommend, which I highly recommend that you watch if you haven't done so yet, because this is where you're gonna learn how to do these, these little tricks that are gonna just help make isolation much easier and practical in your everyday uh, uh, clinical strategies. Now, the clamp that I'm using here is either the 12A or the 13A. These are two clamps that have multiple beaks. You can see that the beaks on the buckle are wider, the beaks on the lingual is, is narrower, which helps you really stabilize that clamp. This is an active clamp because it has, I'm sorry, this is a passive clamp because both beaks are parallel one to the other, but it has multiple beaks so that it really creates this inner, this, uh, this um, very good contact between multiple of these beaks and the tooth keeping that clamp very nice and stable and assuring to you that this rubber dam is not going to go anywhere, which is, again, critical from a clinical standpoint. There you can see if I've sectioned my, my Toffelmeyer band and I am going to now elevate that margin using a resin-modified glass ionomer. You can see that I've elevated that distal margin here. I'm going to go ahead and cut back just to make sure that I keep it below the contact area and then go ahead and restore my contact. And again, using different strategies, I'm going to be able to restore that contact. So that is my final slide for today. I really want to thank everybody that was here in our inaugural case review presentations that we're going to be having every month here at Romero Dental Seminars.